Since before the dawn of history, humankind has found innumerable ways to deal with and reflect upon its own weaknesses and deficiencies, and nothing speaks to this point quite like monsters. From the Gorgons of ancient Greece to the yokai of Japanese lore, monsters have found their way into the traditions of every culture around the globe. For this channel's inaugural video, we are going to examine the origins of these abominations and get to the core of the very human need for things weird, unnatural, and monstrous. I'm Tyler Martin, and this is Monsters from the Id. Monsters have been with us since well before the advent of written language. They populate mythology, folklore, literature, and film in great abundance. Some are divine or supernatural in origin, while others are aberrations of nature roused or even created by man's insatiable desire for mastery over the natural order. In olden times, monsters were often conceived to explain natural phenomena such as storms and earthquakes. With advances in human knowledge, this tendency has long since fallen out of favor. But there is a more fundamental purpose that these creatures serve, and that is what we'll be diving into today. Perhaps we should take a moment to examine the word monster, which comes from the Latin monstrum, defined by scholar Joseph Riddle as anything strange or singular, contrary to the usual course of nature by which the gods give notice of evil, or a strange, unnatural, hideous person, animal, or thing. We should note also that monstrum is itself derived from moneo, meaning to remind, warn, admonish, advise, say what ought to be done or left undone. Stripped down in this way, we get to the real essence of what monsters are. Warnings, reminders, admonitions. While the word monster often carries connotations of evil, these creatures take many forms depending on their purpose. Some are simply mischievous, still others benevolent. At bottom, they all serve to remind us of something vital. Now, I am no psychologist and make no claims of expertise in this field. However, some awareness of human psychology is essential if we want to understand just why we need monsters. In brief, according to Freud, the human mind is divided into three parts. The id, which comprises the primitive and instinctive component of personality and responds to the most basic pleasure instinct. The ego, which works to balance the illogical demands of the id and the requirements of the real world. And the superego, home to the conscience and the source of self-criticism. Undoubtedly, monsters speak to all three parts of the psyche. For instance, the primal fear and pleasure impulses of the id. The logic of the ego, which tempers and informs our approach to things we perceive as monstrous. And the moral lessons we can learn from them, courtesy of the superego. Monsters are, after all, a pretty blunt form of collective self-criticism. To give a personal example, from an early age, monsters have fascinated me. As now, I love stories and movies about monsters. These fearsome creatures held an indefinable but undeniable appeal to my young mind. However, I would often become upset when, at the end of the story, the troublesome fiend was destroyed or subdued. Of course, the simple explanation is that I thought that since the monster was cool, it shouldn't suffer such a fate. When viewing the matter in the light of psychoanalytic theory, one could say that my childhood indignation upon seeing the monster defeated was a pure id response, as the id operates on the pleasure principle and is illogical, irrational, and fantasy-oriented. The idea of the monster gave me pleasure, so seeing it die caused a negative reaction. But as I grew older and the ego and superego developed, my view became more nuanced and well-rounded. Thus, I am now able to better understand just why monsters are so cool. 
It's because they perform the very important function of keeping us in check, warning us against our own indiscretions and misdeeds. They teach us the virtues of caution and humility. On the one hand, the humans of a story vanquishing the monster can be seen positively as a sign that we are greater than our weaknesses and can overcome them. But, on the other, unless we are truly humbled by the experience, the resulting confidence in the greatness and superiority that enabled us to secure that victory will inevitably bolster our arrogance, thus creating the need for more monsters. The name of this channel is, of course, a reference to the science fiction classic Forbidden Planet and its concept of monsters being unleashed from the very depths of the psyche. By experimenting with an alien technology that far surpasses his own understanding, the brilliant Dr. Morbius unwittingly releases a frightful entity which issues from his own subconscious. This beast, a manifestation of the base and aggressive tendencies of the id, is essentially indestructible. Only the death of the individual from whose mind the creature originates can stop it. Just like Dr. Morbius and his monster from the id, only our own extinction can bring an end to our dependence upon monsters. Whether consciously or unconsciously, we as a society tend to see ourselves as lords of all we survey, above the laws of nature, able to bend the earth to our will with impunity. And for as long as that remains the case, we will stand to be laid low, to be reminded of our own faults, our own frailties, and our own foolishness. And for that reason, we will always need monsters. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, please give it a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button, and let me know your thoughts in the comments. I'll see you next time.